It's just a pleasure uh, to get a chance to talk to you about some of the research that we've been doing today. And, um, you know, and I've said this countless times, but this has been the best 12 years of my professional career. I've never, ever worked with a group of people that's so dedicated and talented. Um, and the beauty of it is, even though you know, many of you have stayed throughout my 12 years, there are new people that come in and they are exactly the same. They have the same commitment, they have the same level of expertise and the same passion for what we do. So this is really the best place and the culture, I think, Cindy, as you, as you mentioned, the culture will transcend me, certainly, and it really kind of sets the stage for continued success. So um, I'm sad about transition, but I'm also happy about the transition because I know you're all going to continue to do great things. So these are the disclosures uh, in terms of uh, funding for the research that I'll talk about today. And here's an outline. So I'm going to talk about some clinical trial failures. Um, and that's just the stage to talk about areas where I think we really need to continue to work and improve. Uh, develop outcome measures, we need multimodal treatments. I think we need to think more carefully about participants, particularly on, around issues of equity, which I'll talk about. And then in terms of what we've done to address some of these issues, we're gonna talk about our work on uh, expressive language sampling. Um, and as an outcome measure, we'll talk about our parent implemented language intervention, uh, which I think is really, is potentially useful as a component of clinical trials. And then I'll talk a little bit with less data, but more about some ideas recently about equity, diversity, and the generalizability of results in clinical trials, and then some conclusions. And so I have to start with an, this acknowledgement first and foremost. Uh, so Dr. Angie Thurman uh, started here when I started as a postdoc, and she is now uh, ready for the transition to full professor. And um, just as an example of how well we've worked together, I, I did this count since I like data. And so uh, I think we have 52 co-authored peer-reviewed publications. We have eight or nine chapters together. We have 13 NIH grants we've worked on together. And so it's been an amazing collaboration, but I have to say publicly, she's done the heavy lifting on this. Nothing that's come out of our lab has, has everything that's come out of our lab has had her fingerprints on it. Um, and so what you're hearing today, what you like of it will be from Angie. So, <laughs> what you don't like is mine. <laughs> so, uh, so the bad news is, is there have been a lot of uh, clinical trials, pharmaceutical trials in the area of intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, most of, a lot of it's been in fragile X syndrome, some in Down syndrome, certainly some in autism. Um, and um, the the story, unfortunately, is disappointing in the, in the sense that we see these really promising results from preclinical trials. Uh, and then when we get to clinical trials, really not so much. And, um, and, and it's just as one example, and this is a little dated, but I think this is pretty telling. Uh, so in 2007, uh, there were 22 clinical trials which have led to virtually no significant benefit on the primary outcome measure. Now, in many of these trials, and this has continued to this day, there are some positive results recently, and there are positive results when we do post hoc analyses on some sub samples. Uh, oftentimes, those post hoc findings don't replicate in other studies. And so it's really, obviously, disappointing for families who are depending on getting some help. And so I think one of the things that's really critical is well, why do we have this gap? And I think there are lots of reasons, and I'm not going to touch on all of those. Uh, but here are just some that I'll focus on. Uh, we know that there's a lack of psychometrically sound, meaningful, sensitive measures of change in core symptoms. We need better outcome measures. And, you know, fortunately, a lot of these things are being addressed in the Mind Institute. David Hessel, who's here somewhere, uh, is probably the leader in the world on developing really just psychometrically sound and innovative uh, outcome measures for clinical trials. Um, drug effects are likely to be small, particularly in the, in the populations that we study, right? These are oftentimes older children, adolescents, adults, um, who have had really unusual or non-normative experiences because of their disability in terms of options for learning and things like that. And drug effects are going to be small. We may not be able to see them unless we can magnify them in some way. And I think that doing a multimodal treatment approach is one way to do that. And then lastly, we have this kind of problem of that our participants are heterogeneous on some dimensions that cause problems in detecting the benefits of a treatment. And in other ways, they're homogeneous on really critical dimensions that, allow us, that don't allow us to really produce generalizable results. 
Um, and so uh, in terms of outcome measures, which I'll focus on mainly because that's where most of our data uh, has really come in the last couple of years. And so David uh, has, is really, again, the, really the expert in the country in, uh, on outcome measures. And so he looked at a number of uh, clinical trials, and, and in, there were a lot of them that focused on issues around behavior, and almost all of them used caregiver rating scales. And caregivers um, are, uh, they do their best, but oftentimes the scales are not appropriate to allow them to really be objective, right? And so we have big placebo uh, effects in a lot of clinical trials, and so it makes uh, caregiver rating scales often not useful, although David is addressing that as well. Um, and so there are a few objectively and directly administered measures uh, that have been evaluated for their psychometric adequacy. And part of the problem is, is that, as we know, when we go to, su to submit grants to the NIH, for the most part, they like hypothesis testing. They don't like measure development. That's changed a bit in recent years, and, but we certainly need more of that. So we have focused on language as a treatment outcome uh, for a number of reasons. We think language is, is promising because uh, so many individuals that have neurodevelopmental disabilities have issues with language. And improvements in language, if we can produce them, are meaningful and functional for the individuals. So if you think about your everyday experience uh, in, if, as a child in school or out on the playground or in families, language and communication are kind of the core of what we do. And so if we can really impact language, I think we can really make a difference in people's lives in a meaningful way. So we've developed something called expressive language sampling as, uh, as an outcome measure. And this has a long history of use in clinical contexts and uh, in research, and so we have not invented this by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and, and the basic idea is very simple. Uh, you collect a brief sample of talk, and this is really critical in a naturalistic context. And the idea is then you can then uh, ensure the representativeness of what the person is doing with their language and their communication. Uh, and if you transcribe and analyze this sample of, of language, then you can make inferences about the speaker's language abilities. And again, this has been used for a very long time. And what we have found in the language development field is that if you use expressive language sampling, so you have this naturalistic sample as opposed to standardized language tests, you do much better at identifying people who have language difficulties. You do much better at not um, overrepresenting people from marginalized communities in, in uh, disability groups. Um, and it correlates reasonably well with a whole variety of other measures that are kind of functional and meaningful measures. And so here are just some of the things that we think are um, kind of potential advantages of expressive language sampling, simple to collect, general, uh, performance is generalizable to real context. You can use basically the same sort of format to collect data from children and adults and other things that you can see there as well. So the, the trick or where our role has really come in here is that the performance uh, of the individual that you're assessing is really strongly influenced by the materials that you have, the partner behavior and the task which makes good sense, right? It makes common sense. And the example that I use all the time is if you see someone who, let's say, has to watch a toddler or a three- or four-year-old, and they're not very experienced with children, and they play with them, what the play and the talk ends up being is things like, do you like this one? What about this one? Is this a nice one? Is this blue? Is this red? Do you like bunnies? Right? And so you, you listen to what the child does in response, and what you find is that child's at the one-word stage because everything is yes, no, brown, green, right? And so you have constrained their language. And so what we've done uh, is that we've created procedures for standard, standardizing to a degree uh, how you interact with the child, what the materials are, what the task is, um, and so that we can still hopefully have generalizable results, but we have consistency in terms of time of measurement. We have consistency across uh, participants and the like. And uh, so we were fortunate um, uh, when right after we got here to get funded by the NIH uh, to develop this as an outcome measure. And um, so we called it the Expressive Language Consortium Project, and it really was to kind of take the standardized procedures that we had developed, um, and uh, as well as one other that I'll tell you in a second, and um, to administer those to individuals with Fragile X syndrome or Down syndrome or autistic individuals um, to really look at their psychometric properties. Are they do they yield stable score, scores over the short term? So we have good test re, retest reliability and things like that. And so these are the sites that participated um, in the uh, project. 
Um, not everyone tested all different uh, conditions, but uh, some did. And what we looked at was what we call our conversation task, a narration task, and then we looked at the ADAS2. And the idea with the ADAS2 is it had been proposed as a, a potential expressive language sampling measure because you have these kind of probes that are standardized. Um, and uh, if you're studying uh, a population at risk for autism, you're going to administer this anyway, so if you can also look at it for uh, their language uh, outcomes, um, that's a, a, another plus. Uh, I'm not going to really talk about the ADAS, ADAS2 in terms of what we found. We're still kind of working on some of the analyses. We've published a few things so far. Uh, but the idea with the conversation is that we kind of make it a short interaction. It's about 12 minutes. And where we, the way that we standardize it is we kind of have a list of topics that we kind of go through in a particular order. We uh, have standardized how we introduce the topics, how we follow up on the topics. Uh, there are no materials or play or things like that, so it's kind of a, a a one-on-one -on -one conversation with an adult examiner. In the narrative, we use wordless picture books um, that um, allow to have simple descriptions for children with limited language all the way to kind of complex emotions and intentionality uh, in adults. Um, and it's relatively short uh, to administer. And so we have tried to kind of come up with five basic measures that look at different aspects of language. Uh, and, um, and they're listed here. And so these are really kind of gross measures. The nice thing about language samples is you can also drill down. Once you have the sample, you can analyze it many different ways. But these are the five that we've looked at the psychometrics for. And so we have a measure of talkativeness, uh, which you can see operationalized there, which is a measure of pragmatics or social communication. We have a measure of unintelligibility, one of disfluency, which reflects issues of planning. Uh, a vocabulary measure and a measure of syntax or the ability to combine uh, words into phrases and sentences. And um, all of these, uh, higher is better, except for in unintelligibility, which is uh, you want to have a lower score, reflects fewer articulation problems. But all the other ones, a higher score is better, more advanced. And then what we did is to, we wanted to have convergent validity measures. And so, so we wanted to have some evidence that these things measure something about language, right? And so one of our challenges was, is so when you write this grant and you say, all of these standardized measures are really lacking to characterize language, and then you have to show that your measures correlate with something, you're stuck using the not so great measures. Um, and so we did the best we could to have reasonable measures uh, that are standardized tests. All of these are directly administered except for the Vineland, which is a, a caregiver report measure. So in the project, we had uh, around 300 participants, age range of 6 to 23, uh, a few more individuals with fragile X and Down syndrome than those that were autistic individuals. Um, and the basic structure was we did an initial visit, then we had a retest four weeks later because we wanted to look at are there practice effects, because you don't want practice effects on an outcome measure. You want it stable if you haven't introduced no treatment. Uh, and we wanted to see if the, it was, we had good test re retest reliability. So no practice effects. And those that got high scores tended to get high scores the second time. Those with low scores got low scores the second time, and so on. And then we wanted to see if we could really, whether th these things were sensitive to change. Uh, and so we uh, did a one-year follow-up for those with Fragile X or Down syndrome, all of whom had an intellectual disability. And we did a, I'm sorry, yeah, one year. And we did a two-year follow-up for uh, the autistic individuals in our sample. And they were not constrained to have an intellectual disability. Some did, some did not. But we had the full range there. And in terms of generalizability, one thing here is that I think is important, that all of these individuals that were in this study had the capacity uh, for some multi-word language occasionally. So they produced two and three-word utterances on occasion. So this is not the measure that you're going to use for everybody. So that's kind of the, the lower level. So here's just some examples for conversation, some of the things that we use as these standardized prompts. And then here's the Mercer Mayer Frog book. Uh, child language researchers collectively around the world have probably bought two million of these Mercer Mayer books. Um, um, and it's increasingly hard to find them. Sometimes we go to eBay and things like that. Uh, I'm going to present lots of data, and I'm only going to talk about pieces of each one. And so one of the first things we wanted to know, and this is a, a study, uh, this is the for the Down syndrome sample, and, and Angie led this uh, part of the project. Um, we just wanted to see, 
do kids comply? Do you get meaningful data? And we had a number of different ways of looking at this in terms of like number of utterances, uh, the time frame uh, in terms of participation, and then just whether they were really compliant and on task. Um, and so the, the blue is, is our judgments of noncompliance. And you can see conversation, very few of the children uh, and adolescents and young adults were noncompliant, uh, a bit more with the narration, but still it was around 14%. So it's still a reasonable uh, uh, you know, noncompliance rate to make it useful uh, in clinical trials. Um, practice effects, and so again, this is over a four-week interval, more or less, uh, and you want no practice effects, ideally, and once you correct for doing multiple tests, there were no significant differences, and you can see from the, the Cohen's D, which is just a measure of kind of the, the magnitude of the difference, these were all really small changes, and so there really were no meaningful practice effects, and so that was good. Um, here is whether we had test retest reliability, and these are the uh, simple correlations and then interclass correlations. And I really like this slide uh, because I've never had anything that had three asterisks on every cell <laughs> in my whole career. And so these are re so people are really consistent. Not only are they not they, are they not getting better on average. I mean, you certainly could have uh, for a group wise, you could have like no practice effects. But when you talk about the individual, you could still have a change. There really was not much change. People were really consistent over the short term in this sample of individuals with Down syndrome. And so this is just uh, whether these things correlated with the standardized measure that they were supposed to correlate with. And what you can see is that our vocabulary measure correlated well, so there's construct validity there. Um, our syntax measure correlated where it should. Our unintelligibility measure correlated where it should. Um, our, uh, our talkativeness measure and our disfluency measure did not, and that's a consistent theme. So out of these five measures we compute, we don't have really evidence at this point that there's construct validity for those. For narration, it's exactly the same story. Um, and then we looked at uh, fragile X, the Fragile X sample separately, and I won't give you the data, just kind of some summaries. We also had, it was a little bit larger sample, so we, did a, we stratified it in a number of different ways to see what the psychometrics were and how that changed. When we stratified by age, and we had fewer uh, participants in the 6 to 11 group, um, we found higher non-compliance, non-completion rates for the youngest groups, which did not really surprise us. Um, there were no practice effects at any age, and weaker psychometrics in terms of test, retest, and construct validity for the youngest group, uh, but still at least reasonable. Um, when we stratified by IQ, so we did a median split and looked at those as a function of IQ, there was no difference in the psychometrics. The psychometric group were just as good whether we're talking about a, a more able or less able group, at least as reflected by IQ. And then when we stratified by uh, ADOS to severity score, really pretty negligible differences. And so at least across the range of autism symptom severity and the range of IQ, um, these things work quite well. So uh, this is a little bit outside the consortium project. This is in another project we have looking at transition age youth with fragile X syndrome. And what we did here is we looked at our three measures that had good construct validity and we asked do these things, you know, our claim is that these are predictive of meaningful behavior in the real world. And so we looked at whether these were correlated for a sample of uh, older adolescents and young adults with fragile X syndrome. Do these really correlate with some indicators of how life is going? Um, and so we have the Wasteman uh, uh, activities of daily living, which is an adaptive measure. We have three subscales uh, from the Vineland. We have the social participation index, which really looks at the extent to which people are active socially in their communities, and then um, the uh, social determination scale. Are they actively involved in making choices about their lives? And as you can see, um, um, all three of the measures were correlated with a lot of the measures so that these language measures are really correlated with things that are meaningful in terms of participation in life, uh, so beyond communication. And so we think that that's good evidence, and I think th that's the sort of evidence we should have for all outcome measures when we have them in clinical trials. Uh, I think if they don't predict anything about real world performance and, and quality of life, I, I wonder whether they're really as useful as we think they are. So this I know you can't read, so you're going to have to take my word on this. And so we also wanted to see, so we have these five separate measures, and we wanted to see if... Um, we can create composites, so things that are kind of reflective of kind of a more general language and a communication ability. 
And so the only point here is so that we did this separately for our participants with Fragile X syndrome and our participants with Down syndrome. And we found three composites uh, doing a principal components analysis. And, and the only reason I'm showing this is that the composites were a little bit different for the two groups, suggesting that th these things really need, we may need to refine our scores based on particular characteristics of the uh, group of participants that we're recruiting into a clinical trial or treatment study. So basically, in Fragile X syndrome, the first principal component really kind of took uh, vocabulary and syntax and planning or our disfluency measure, and then unintelligibility and talkativeness were kind of separate things, but for Down syndrome, the uh, main component focused, uh, loaded highly on syntax, vocabulary, and unintelligibility. And so, again, just a reflection, these things may work differently in different populations, and we need to just be aware of that. So I'm going to shift gears now and talk about uh, treatment intervention. Um, and we have a little, I'm going to throw less data at you on this, but uh, in some respects, this has been the most interesting of what we've done recently, uh, and I think really important, and I hope that this will start to influence how people think about doing drug trials. So our point here is that we really think that there is good reason to include a behavioral intervention along with a drug when you do a clinical trial. And I think this has happened certainly in the ADH field. It hasn't happened so often in uh, other uh, neurodevelopmental conditions. So the idea here is that uh, if you provide simultaneously a behavioral intervention, um, you could really boost the effect of the drug because now you're testing the drug in an enriched learning, uh, in a primed neural network which has a richer learning experience. So let me kind of unpack that a little bit here. So if you take a child, uh, let's say a 10-year-old child that has an intellectual disability, and you somehow improve brain function so that learning should be smoother, more effective, what do you really expect to happen in terms of what you can see in a short-term trial? Again, a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old has had really, with an intellectual disability, has had non-normative learning experiences. They've been in different kinds of classes. They've experienced different sorts of interactions in the world. Um, they also um, have developed strategies for learning which are not maybe optimal. So ch normalizing brain function, whatever that means, is not all of a sudden going to produce dramatic change in the short term. It's just not going to happen. And so we may have a, a drug that improves at the level of brain, but we don't see anything in the readout. Um, if we kind of give an uh, enriched environment for a period of time, then we have a better effect to see that the learning is improved, that the outcomes are better. And so I think, um, again, until we understand and have more powerful medications, we may need to pair these things to see effects. Otherwise, we may throw out drugs that are actually potentially beneficial, we're just not seeing the effects. Um, the other thing is that oftentimes what happens is that, um, and this is a little oversimplistic, but sometimes we don't have a good rationale for the outcome measures we pick in these treatment studies, right? We go, well, it's going to improve cognition, and so, you know, what's the cognitive measure we should use? What, should it, what aspect of cognition should it measure? We don't really have a good rational basis. But, you know, if we do something like we pair a language intervention with a drug we think is going to improve learning, well, the outcome measure should measure language. Because if you're not improving language when you give this drug and you give this powerful, hopefully powerful language intervention and you don't see any signal, well, then the drug is probably not working, right? And so it gives us a more rational basis for choosing what, where we look for change. Um, and I think it also avoids the ethical and logistical problems raised by a placebo arm. You know, how many times, I mean, any of you who have done clinical trials, right, how many times does a family come to you and say, I'm interested in being this as long as I'm not in the placebo, right? And so, and when a family comes in and they're in a placebo, they're also giving up a lot, right? I mean, sometimes the kids come off of other medications or other treatments that they have. They're investing a lot of time um, for the greater good. And that doesn't always feel right. And so I think trying to always give families something that's going to produce potential benefit, um, I think is really important. And the problem is it's more costly, right? And so I think we have to think about that. And I think we have to really try and, and both make behavioral interventions more cost effective, but I think we really have to pair them with drugs. Um, 
we've liked the idea of using parent-implemented interventions um, for a couple of reasons. Um, and the whole idea with a parent-implemented intervention is that you train parents to do things that will support their children's development, right? That will facilitate learning in a particular domain. And the good thing about that and the reason that people like that is in theory, if you have given parents skills that will allow them to help their children, they are empowered and they're gonna spend more time with their child than any therapist ever will, right? And so you're really boosting the potential therapeutic. Um, and the, the other thing that makes it, I think, tractable in, uh, in even a rigorous th design, although I have to say not all reviewers agree with me on this, um, is that because parents will vary in how quickly they learn something, how extensively they will use it once it's learned, um, you have variation. And so in theory, statistically, you can, you can parse the effects of a drug from the effects of the parent-implemented intervention. And so you can do these things so you can learn the active ingredients of this multimodal intervention um, in a way that is scientifically satisfying without really having families receive nothing. But again, not every reviewer agrees with me on this. Um, we've used uh, parent-implemented language interventions uh, that the acronym is PELI. Um, it's really the only time that I've ever done anything that has a pronounceable acronym for some reason. But, <laughs> but I'm, I'm sure I didn't invent that. I think maybe it was Lauren came up with PELI. I don't know. So, so here's the, the rationale, is that we know that the ways in, in which caregivers interact with and talk to children shapes language development. We have decades of research on typically developing children that shows that. And the really interesting thing is that the same things, the same sorts of behaviors that support language and communication development in typically developing children, we, we have found, and there's good data from longitudinal studies, that this is what supports development in children that have fragile X syndrome, or children that have autism, or children that have Down syndrome, or any other condition. The challenge is that many of the behaviors that these children have kind of get in the way of, of parents and caregivers doing that. And so the way to help parents is to kind of figure out how they can increase the likelihood of, of the, these behaviors being effective. Decrease certain behaviors that get in the way and then do these things kind of in more intense and maybe uh, more intentional ways than we would do uh, typically. Um, and so this is not that parents have done anything wrong, they've adapted to their children and they're dealing with situations that many of us are not prepared for. So we kind of reorient parents to do the things that we think are really uh, kind of what would come naturally in most situations. Um, and so um, the, the good thing about this is that we've also been able to, and other people have done this as well and probably done this better than we've done in many respects, is that you can, uh, if you're gonna train parents, you can train parents in their homes and you can do this through telehealth technology. Um, and I actually like using telehealth technology rather than say we use video conferencing, but that's what it is, right? And so um, the beauty of that is that that is really cost effective and you know, after the pandemic, everyone knows how to Zoom, right? So, um, so some of the advantages of, of doing this parent implemented language intervention and doing it through distance are as follows. It's a low burden on family relative to having to come into a, a university site, a clinic and so on. Many families don't live close to a place where they can do this, uh, and so it really decreases the burden. Uh, it supports generalization. You're teaching parents how to interact with their children in their home rather than in, in an unusual circumstance of a clinic with everyone watching them from the observation room. Um, this is accessible to the majority of families. Not everyone, right? Not everyone has access to uh, stable broadband internet, but certainly increasing numbers of families do. Uh, and again, it's cost effective um, in terms of not having to have travel costs. It could be more effective in terms of the number of families a clinician sees uh, and so on. And so we've done a number of these studies with um, different populations, different ages. And here are just some of our um, uh, citations for some of the work. And I'm just going to go into detail on, a, on um, uh, one of these. And so, uh, and I should say that Andy McDuffie, who also came at the same time that I came here to run our lab, is really uh, the one that kind of started our path toward uh, intervention research. Um, and it's really because she got tired of me, like, doing things that describe problems and, try, and not trying to solve problems, was how she put it. 
Um, although I think that there were a few harsher words in there than that. Um, and um, so in this uh, intervention um, that I'm going to tell you about, this was really developed for older children and adolescents with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And it's, it's kind of an interact, so it's a parent and the um, adolescent, uh, and they are essentially talking, interacting around a book. So it's really the shared storytelling. But the books don't have words, and so it's not a literacy intervention. It's really just using the book as a topic of conversation. And we felt that that was really appropriate. M most of the other parent-implemented language interventions are with younger kids, and it involves toy play. Well, that's not going to work with a 16-year-old, right? And so we really needed to make this um, adaptive for who our population was, independent of what their level of intellectual uh, ability was, we really wanted to, to honor where they were in terms of, of age. And so, um, uh, and the parents, I have to say, the parents were very skeptical. You know, they would say, my teenager doesn't even want to sit down with me, let alone look at a book and talk about a book. But we were right, they were wrong. Um, <laughs> in most instances. Um, and so again, the book is, is, is not about reading, it's about having a shared topic. And so the, the basic intervention is the parent and child look at the book together, talk about the book, and we give parents scripts and um, ways to kind of get that going and how to deal with challenging behavior and how to in increase engagement. Um, and eventually, as the parent and child work on this book together over, over days, the, the parent helps the child to take more and more of a role, right? So they're playing a more active role. Um, and the, the intervention that we uh, uh, implement is really that we teach the parent through didactics, and so we have PowerPoint slides and video examples, and they, again, they're doing this at home. They can watch this uh, over Zoom or Skype or whatever. Um, and then the real work is that we coach them in real time. So they use a bug in the ear, and as they interact with their kids, we give them encouragement, we give them suggestions. Um, and so it's really the coaching that happens that's critical. And then they will also do, in many of our studies, they do homework, they send us a video, uh, the clinician will give them feedback and so on. And so I think, I think the coaching is critical. If you just give people the information, it's really not intuitive how you do all of these things. Um, and so then, and I should point out, is that there's a different book each week, and the book is different from the baseline and the assessment. And so this is not about learning how to tell a story. It's learning how to tell stories in general together and participate together. And so the things that we uh, taught parents how to do is how to use story-related talking. So basically how to keep the child engaged in the story and talking, right? Uh, so stay on topic, basically. Uh, how to expand the child's utterances. So if the child says something that's a two-word sentence, give it back to them in a way that's a little more sophisticated. So that as they're talking and as they're paying attention to something, you give them kind of a, more information about how they can use more sophisticated language. You ask open-ended WH questions rather than those yes-no questions. Uh, and then you use fill-in-the-blank prompts. So things like, that is, the boy is going to the, and just to get them talking and engaged. And so um, that's what we did. Again, both didactics, but really it's the coaching that was re the really critical thing. And so we did a small-scale uh, randomized controlled trial of this. And so we had 20 boys with fragile X syndrome uh, between the ages of 10 and 17. Um, all of the all of the caregivers were biological mothers in this case, uh, and it was really a treatment or no treatment. So basically treatment, giving them the parent implemented language intervention, uh, or basically treatment as usual, whatever treatment they were getting in the community. And we did pre and post intervention assessments. And again, the intervention was delivered at home via distance teleconferencing as of 12 weeks of intervention. I'm going to show you some of the results. And so uh, basically, and again, so the main thing to remember with this, and I think sometimes people lose sight of this, is that the, the real intervention is what the parents do, not what we've done. We've given the parents the tool. If they don't use those tools, the child is not getting any intervention, right? And so it's really encouraging the parents to use these like throughout the day. Um, one of our challenges, although we've done a better job recently of trying to do this, is how do we know how often the parent's using it, right? We're not like always in the home, we're not prying, uh, but in some of our, in the, study I'll tell you about next, we've also done things like have clinicians rate how comfortable the parents seem when they do their homework, 
how effective they are in their homework. We have parents do diaries and those sorts of things, and so try to get it indirectly. But we don't have a good direct measure of it yet. But this is just to show you that in, in three of the areas where we were teaching parents things that they improved. And so the, the gold is the uh, no treatment group, and then the blue bars are the treatment group. And as you can see from pre to post, uh, the parents improved. Uh, they used open-ended questions more frequently. They used expansions more frequently than they did at baseline. And they used fill-in-the-blank prompts. Um, their interactions also got a lot longer, and they had more on-topic utterances, but I don't have those data to show. And certainly there was no improvement in the no treatment group over the 12 weeks. So parents learn, as a group, parents learn, learn this, but there was considerable variability. And I, I don't have a slide for this, but I want to come back to some of the characteristics of, pa of parents that turn out to matter uh, for how effective they are. And so our main measure of uh, child outcomes was uh, our vocabulary measure, so a number of different words that were produced. And you could see um, over the 12 weeks that there was really no change in the treatment group, but there, the vocabulary use really expanded significantly for the uh, children in the treatment groups. Um, and so the one thing I did want to mention here is so um, Lauren Bullard and, and uh, Sarah Potter have also recently uh, combined data from several studies that we've done and asked questions about do we, can we understand some of the variability and its consequences in, in parents. And one of the things that we found, and we worried about this from the beginning, is kind of, you know, it's hard enough to be a parent now. We're asking you to learn things and be a therapist. Um, and so we've done exit interviews with parents, and parents almost uh, invariably felt really empowered, they felt closer to their child, they liked to see the progress, and they felt like they had some control over their children's lives as opposed to relying only on professionals. They also learned that um, a lot of clinicians were not very good at telling them that what they were doing, and so that they were more confident in asking what the interventions were that they were doing with their children. Um, however, the thing that that Lauren and Sarah, when they compiled our data and looked at, we had measures of uh, mental health and stress and uh, kind of other challenges that, fam that parents might have. And maybe not surprisingly, um, more mental health, more stress led parents to be less effective in learning. And so the, the kind of the takeaway for us is, you know, we need a multimodal intervention also has to focus on parents to give them the skills that they need. And maybe it doesn't happen simultaneously. Maybe you have to provide some sort of stress re reduction uh, therapies for parents before you even start these sort of interventions so you can kind of maximize the impact. I want to tell you a little bit about this other uh, parent implemented uh, language intervention that study that we embedded into a drug trial. And this was a really um, large scale trial. This was a Neuronext study. This was the Fragile X Learn. It was led by uh, Lisbury Kravitz at Rush, and Rondi and I were uh, uh, MPIs on this. David was involved in, an, in a number of these. And so this is a multi-site uh, intervention, and it was designed to uh, test AFQ56, which is a, a um, um, targets the MGLUR5 system, which is overexpressed in individuals with fragile X syndrome. And so this, was, this drug had been purported to kind of reduce the glutamate activity. And there was some kind of minimally positive results, but not consistent in previous trials. And so this trial was designed to really, for once and for all, tell us whether this drug worked. And so the way that, that the design worked was that it was a larger sample than ever before. We had 100 participants. Um, we went younger than ever before, so it was two to six-year-olds, and the idea being perhaps we can have more impact on brain development if we go younger rather than older. Um, and it was a longer intervention. It was 18 months of treatment uh, or with a long placebo running. Run and uh, then we paired it with our parent implemented language intervention. And this was a more of a play-based intervention, intervention since it was two to six year olds. And um, uh, it, we also had the, the uh, misfortune of having started this right before the pandemic and then had to shift a lot of things that we were doing both in terms of intervention and, and assessment. But we ended up having, uh, I think, 100 participants um, with about equal representation, with no real differences between the, the uh, placebo group and the treatment group. So again, half placebo, half drug, everyone got the parent-implemented language intervention. And so um, in terms of results, so, this is, so the, the blue are the uh, 
are the placebo, the red are the treatment, these are individual plots. And so we did a split um, to look at those who started with higher uh, communication scores. So the WCS is the weighted communication score. And it's kind of a measure of the extent to which you're um, communicating, the frequency of your communication kind of weighted by the sophistication of your communication, if you're gestural or if you're using words or uh, combinatorial language. And so these are the, the children who were kind of above the moralist median uh, when they started. And there was um, no real change in this measure, um, and there was no difference between the placebo and the AFQ56 group. However, when we looked at the uh, kids who were lower on the, the uh, WCS, so they had kind of less sophisticated or less frequent communication, we saw uh, improvement in the placebo group. Okay? And so we're not entirely sure why that is. Uh, but there was some evidence that there might have been some adverse side effects to the medication that might impact uh, one's um, participation in social interaction, right? And so um, if that's true, that the drug actually hurt rather than helped. But clearly what we learned from this is that we have more evidence that the parent-implemented language intervention helps. I mean, not a whopping effect, but there is improvement there for at least some children. And that once and for all, AFQ56 is not something we should put our money on, right? This is, we gave it its best shot, if you will. And so, again, um, it would have been great if we would have seen that the intervention boosted the effects of a really helpful drug, but that's not the case. So, um, and so, again, I really think that these, um, you know, it's, this is still too costly to do on scale, but I think one of the things we'd like to do with the intervention is, you know, can we really kind of, pare it down in some way and still make it effective so that it's more likely to be combined with drugs. So I want to talk uh, now about participants. In, and here is, I really don't have data to show you, but I have, uh, maybe so this is where maybe where I preach a little bit more. So, um, and so, you know, I, I, I had various points in this talk. I was going to give shout outs to different people, but I knew I would not hit everyone. Um, but I really have to do, Big shout out here uh, to Janice Enriquez, uh, who has made um, uh, she has made such a difference, and and I really have learned so much in the three or so years that we've worked together, and then to the entire DEI committee. Um, it's just it's really changed my thinking um, about how I think about research, how I think about clinical care and how I think about life and, and as a human being. Um, and so, um, so apologies to everyone I'm not giving a shout out to. So, um, so just two examples of the lack of diversity in treatment studies. So the first is the study I just showed you, right? This is the clinical trial, this large clinical trial, which costs $11.4 million to do. Uh, I think we learned a lot. But if you look at the, the breakdown of the participants, 85% white, 4% black, and African American is not representative sample, okay? If we look at the economic standing, you would not be surprised at either, right? Um, this study by Brooke Ingersoll and a group, I just picked this because this is a really interesting study. They do great intervention work and it's very recent. Um, and so it's this apparent implemented intervention that they do. 80% white, 6% black, African American, 94% not Hispanic, Latino. So we are not doing a good job in these treatment studies of having representative samples. Um, and so that limits the generalizability of our scientific findings. And that's really a problem as scientists, right? And we need to figure that out. Uh, it denies potential benefits of treatment to people from historically marginalized groups. Uh, we reinforce uh, feelings of mistrust and exclusion among marginalized people who have been, have good reason not to trust academic institutions and, and, and other institutions. And if we are perpetuating and contributing to systemic biases and discrimination when we allow that to go on. And so I think this is really a call to change how we do things. Uh, I don't have all the answers here, uh, but I do think that, and we I got to write this a paper with uh, my former graduate student who's now at University of Washington faculty about some of these issues and, and a lot more. And I think that it just, um, you know, and one of, and so it was, a, uh, it was an article in a special issue, and so we had wonderful commentaries. 
afterward really brought in things that we hadn't thought about. But we had one from people at the NIH that work in the intellectual development and disability branch, and NIH is really starting to take notice that they have an obligation to do better, and they're also going to hold us accountable in different ways for this. So I think this is something that we have to figure out as the Mind Institute. Uh, so again, you can't read this at all. This is, uh, here's one solution is that I think we have to work harder at having outcome measures that are culturally and linguistically appropriate for other populations. And we've started to do that in our lab. And this is a study that uh, Laura Del Hoyo Soriano, who was a postdoc from Spain and then was a research scientist in our lab, did. And this is taking our, one of our expressive language sampling procedures, the narrative task. And she did two things that I thought were really interesting and important to kind of help us address diversity issues. She um, created a Spanish language version, so that was the one thing. And the other thing is that we decided we're going to train parents to administer this test so they can do it at home. And so we're hopefully addressing some of the logistical barriers that parents face to want to participate in research um, and also addressing the language issue. And so what, she was what she was able to show, and kind of in the gray, is that um, most of the families learn this to uh, our criterion uh, quite well, and they, most of them are consistent. Some were a little bit variable in how they applied this, but you know, I think we have to tweak our training. So parents can learn to do this, and they can learn to do it whether they're speaking Spanish or English, it doesn't matter, and they can do it in their home through telehealth. And we now just have a grant that we started um, that Angie uh, is involved in, and Jennifer Villarreal, who is, is our uh, graduate student from Ecuador is involved in, and we're, we're kind of doing the full psychometrics on this and development on this in uh, Spanish-speaking uh, families of children with Down syndrome, and so we're really excited about that. But I think we have to do better at having measures that are appropriate for um, the populations we want to serve. Um, the other thing is I think we have to avoid reliance on recruitment through, uh, through sources that are not diverse. And we continue to do that as a field. I mean, and in many respects, we're kind of forced to do that. But if, we, if you take any of the uh, rare conditions we study, look at things like SYNGAP1, ADMP, Fragile X syndrome, look at where we recruit families. We recruit through foundations, right? But if you look at the members of these foundations, they are not diverse, right? And for good reasons, right? And, and so if we continue to rely on that, we're not going to get diverse samples. So one way is to partner with these foundations to increase their representation so that they are actually serving more people and that we can help to recruit families into our research. Um, we also, as, as much as we have relied and benefited from having our online registry, we know that um, the people who sign up for online registries are not diverse economically, not racially, ethnically, and they tend to be the families who are committed to research and value research and those that don't or don't know about research are not signing up. So we can't just keep doing that and, and hope that somehow that's going to solve our problem. It's, it's a good start, but we need to do more. And so we really need to build meaningful partnerships in diverse communities before trying to recruit people. Right? And I think that means we have to be visible in these communities. We have to listen. We have to help. But we have to help in ways that they ask us to do, not ways that we think they need help. We need to reduce barriers to participation. We need to include members of the community, however we de define that community, in design, implementation, and dissemination. And they have to be real partners. They, uh, they can't just be volunteers. They have to be members of our staff. We have to honor them through publications when it warrants that. Um, and we have to address research questions that matter to the community. And so, you know, I think we need to listen to see what people want, and then we have to try and address that. But that doesn't mean that basic science is not going to be palatable or useful for these communities. You know, I think oftentimes, and we've seen examples of this in, in the big genetics project in the UK that got shut down because they really hadn't partnered with autistic individuals, right? Uh, if we do a better job at explaining the importance of our research to the communities that we want to help, you know, we have to trust them to understand that, and they will go along with that, but we have to work at it. And so I think we need to really start to, we need to, you know, think about this, and we need to start and maintain partnerships that are beyond the duration of the study. And then the other thing is we have to do a better job of recruiting diverse staff. We just have to. We have to have people from communities that we want to help be part of what we do. The other thing I want to say, and I'm going to say less about this, but um, as people that know me, this is one of the things that I complain about a lot. Um, 
uh, I think we have to really abandon exclusive reliance on diagnostic criterion, uh, uh, diagnostic categories as entry criterion for studies. You know, I, if we're going to do a study of anxiety, why can't we include people with Down syndrome, people with Fragile X syndrome, autistic individuals who all have anxiety? Oftentimes, we don't know what the mechanistic, that there, we don't have reason to suspect mechanistic differences um, between these as regards anxiety. But if we involve everyone in, this, in the study, we give them a particular treatment, and we find differences as a, as a function of their diagnosis, well, then we've learned something about mechanisms, so it could be really useful. I think the other problem with having these diagnostic categories, even when they're biologically based, is uh, we really ignore the heterogeneity. In a lot of the Fragile X clinical trials and in some, a lot of the Down syndrome trials that I've been involved in, there's not much thought for, you know, what should be the inclusion exclusion criteria. It's kind of like, let's get as many people in that have that diagnosis as possible. And that's really not good science, right? We really, really need to understand where we expect the, what we expect the biggest impact will be on people, and then that's who we should recruit. Uh, I also think this provides a rationale for ignoring other dimensions of the individual. So if we th think that the most important thing about people is their diagnosis, then it doesn't matter what their gender is, what their race is, what their ethnicity is, what language they speak. We are interchangeable. And so we continue to reinforce what I think is really these kind of systemic barriers and these systemic mechanisms of, of discrimination and bias. And so I think we really need to kind of think differently about our categories. The conclusions, that just as the kind of the reminders, um, we need psychometrically sound outcome measures that assess skills and behaviors that are meaningful and functional for the individual uh, and that support the inclusion of diverse samples uh, of participants into our treatment studies. We need to develop and evaluate multi-component treatments, but we can do that in designs that allow us kind of the scientific rigor we want to pull things apart and to understand the components. I think it's doable. It's more expensive, at least initially, but I think we're throwing out treatments that work just because we're not doing it correctly. And we need to create meaningful partnerships and build trust in the community's interest uh, to ensure diverse representation. I don't think we're going to be allowed anymore to, to submit, you know, here are the demographics of the region, and that's good enough. It's just not, and it shouldn't be good enough for any of us in the field. I mean, we're committed to helping people, but if we're only helping a segment of people, I think that's, that's we should be ashamed of that, right? And so I think we need to do better. Um, so here are my other thank yous. Um, uh, there are too many people to really call out, um, and people have contributed in different ways. Uh, the, la the last person I have to call out um, for a shout out is Rondi. So, you know, first of all, I started on Fragile X Syndrome because Rondi, when she came to visit me at Wisconsin, said, why are you doing that? You need to work on Fragile X Syndrome. And she scared me so much, it was like, okay, right? And then, um, and then we had a, a, a grant together uh, when I was at Wisconsin and here, and uh, Rondi always uh, was just so supportive and uh, encouraged me to come here and to think about coming here. And so, you know, I owe so many dimensions of my career uh, to Rondi, uh, like so many of us do, like thousands and millions of people around the earth uh, owe so much to Rondi. So, um, and most of all, you know, we owe so much to the families who continue to amaze me at their generosity and their willingness to give up their time and, and, and effort um, and, you know, for the greater good, even when it doesn't benefit them. So, I mean, it's, you know, again, I've always felt that it's a privilege to do what we do um, and, uh, you know, and, and families in many respects are grateful for so little. So I think we owe them everything we can. And again, this is, I've never been in a place where the culture is more conducive to helping families and to doing the right thing than here. So thank you very much for listening. My question probably would be, what are we gonna do without you? But I'll say it a little bit differently. And just to hear, where do you think we should go from here on, on research? I think issues of health disparities um, are really need to be central to what we do. Um, and again, I don't think that that um, um, leaves out what basic scientists do. I think we just need to have more integration so that we think about that. Um, uh, you know, again, I think, you know, I, you know, so I really have come in the last couple of years to really think that if we don't change this and address health disparities and, and have equitable participation in research, I think we really are part of the problem, right? I mean, and I think that it's honest to figure out how to do that. And so I think things like um, um, 
really putting resources into doing good in the community for no reason other than we're doing good. Um, and I think that that will help us when we want to recruit them into genetic studies. I think it will help us when we want to get our results into people's hands that can use them. And so I think, I think that's going to be really critical. And I think if we don't do that, I think we're going to be more isolated and our research will be less impactful. But again, I think it can be, I think basic scientists uh, have as much a role in this as ever. And the other thing that I, I do think is I think we do have to continue to work on how we frame what we do in ways that are not pathologizing of individuals that we work with. And, and I think, you know, we've begun to do great things here. I think having um, non-scientists come and talk in DLS is a good part of that. Um, but I, but I think if we don't change that, uh, I think, you know, and it's hard to give up the way we talk about things. I mean, disorders, using the word disorder comes naturally because we, that's how we were kind of raised. Uh, but I think we need to kind of shift our focus to thinking about how we help people live the best lives possible. And that involves all of us, whether we're doing basic science or clinical science. I think that's what we want to do. We just need to talk about it in that way. So. Thank you very much, and thanks for having this to be open. Appreciate it. Hey, um, I just wanted to put a plug in um, for the institute to consider doing more, doing something with FASD studying. I have a foster son. We had no idea until he was in his 20s. I had to bring him to San Diego for a diagnosis. And I really don't even have a doctor who knows how to treat it properly. I have to ask my, the other parents through Facebook. It's not really fair for us, really not fair for us. I wasn't planning to be even a foster parent, but, um, we met him through the CASA program, and we're not going to let this kid, you know, just, he was homeless and criminal, you know, everything. And it just, we just need more help. And you have a doctor now who's been hired, but he, she needs some support, Dr. Jasmine. But, um, but it's not, it, there really needs to be more support in Northern California because there's hardly any in California, but we had to go to San Diego for it. Well, I think, you know, I think the, the clinical uh, expertise that we now have, which we didn't have before, is a really good start. Um, and I think that, um, you know, one of the things that will kind of encourage researchers to address those issues is having families come to us and, and see us as a source of support and help. You know, it's one of the things, and, and Down syndrome is a, new, is a relatively new area for us. And, um, and it's been difficult sometimes to recruit families into, into studies that we're doing because they don't see us as a resource for Down syndrome. And so, but we provide clinical services and we're expanding that as well. So, so I think it's a beginning, but I, I, I understand. Um, but, you know, we also, as we look at, you know, the, the Institute is, is looking at, and uh, Marjorie Solomon, who is our interim director when I stepped on November 1st, Marjorie has kind of led along with uh, Melissa Bauman and Judy Vanderwater and others, our strategic planning, and it's like, well, what are the new areas that we want to go into? And, you know, and uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm, there, there are a number of my colleagues who probably are a little older than I am, and so there will be retirements, right? And so, you know, the question is, is you know, who do we become as an institute going forward? And I think we want to do that in a planful way. And so I can't predict what areas we're going to, the institute will be doing in five years, but I suspect they're not going to be exactly the same because we'll, we'll have people that have either different techniques for the conditions we currently study and treat, and uh, there will be new areas. Thank you for your question, though. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.